so he's our speaker today. We'll be speaking about uh, CLI, which is really exciting. I'm really excited about it. He says it's a very beginner uh, presentation, which is awesome because I know very little about it. Uh, but uh, it'll be really exciting to learn. Uh, he's also our food sponsor for today, which is really awesome. Uh, typically, uh, Sean is our community leader. Uh, I'm filling in for today. Um, he sadly couldn't make it, uh, but he will be here next time. Uh, and with further ado, I'll give it over to Bradley. Thank you again for presenting. All right, thank you. So, as, uh, as you mentioned, my name is Bradley Gore. I'm with a company called Adabra. It's, it's a, a local consulting firm, and we do software consulting for companies uh, kind of all over the nation. Um, <laughs> And so today's talk is about building your own CLI. And uh, if you are extremely fond of acronyms, Theocracy. <laughs> so I don't care for acronyms, but CLI is a very common acronym in the field uh, that you'll hear. And it basically just stands for Command Line Interface. So before, before going too far into your journey as a, as a developer, you kind of learn that an interface is basically just anything that lets a thing interact with another thing. So a graphical interface allows you to interact with maybe, um, if you're on Amazon's website, their graphical interface allows you to interact with goods and a shopping cart and a payment system. Okay? A command line interface allows you to interact with some other some thing, but it's a lot more uh, it's, it's a lot less frills and whistles, right? So it's just text. It's all text all the time. So now that we kind of know the what the acronym CLI stands for, let's, let's take a look at really kind of the, the bullet points of what we'll go through on this talk, kind of the, the agenda here. The first thing is that we're going to define what a CLI is. And we've, we've already started on that, but there's a little bit more that we'll talk about. Why would you build and or use a CLI? So a lot of times as developers, we see, and it's not just developers, you, you can see this in any industry, you see where people find a shiny new thing and it's like, oh, I have a shiny new hammer, everything is a nail, and they, and they swing that tool and they use that tool for everything. With command line interfaces, we need to kind of take a step back and realize, okay, this is another tool that we can have in our tool belt, and we need to kind of have some things that we look for, some indicators that tell us when is the right time, when is the right place to use a CLI. I want to go over some core tenets of a CLI, and then a thing I call parsing the argv. So argv is going to be a thing that is going to be new to some people possibly, um, and so it, we'll talk a little about what that is and why it is and how it works, and then we'll look at some CLI abstractions at the very end. So before we get too far into this, I just want to iterate that this is a very beginner level talk. Um, here at the Borough Dev Meetup, I've, as coming here, I've noticed that there's a lot of people that are from the code camps and the things like that, so I don't want to dive into like the deep end. This is hopefully going to be something that you are going to be able to take home and play with and, and interact with at, at a, a beginner level. So what is a CLI and maybe what it's not? So we talked about it being a text-based interface, so it's all text all the time, unless your terminal supports emoji um, or unless you are, are using ASCII art. How many are familiar with ASCII art? Okay, so that's kind of like before we had emoji, we used these symbols and slashes and it would take like a whole page to draw a symbol or to draw a shape and it would be basically just whatever text you could get to make the shading look right and the, the outline look right and all that stuff. Um, we have terminals nowadays that also support emoji, which is graphical images, right? So those are a little bit fun. So if I were to say um, that a CLI is a tool where users can access your service at scale. Who would agree with that statement? Who would think, yeah, CLI would let your users access at scale, which basically means that it could be one user or it could be 11,000 users like Amazon Web Services. How many don't agree with that statement? Okay, and this is, look, there's no gotchas here. There's not like a, this is basically just trying to get people to think. This is again like, to, to recognize what the tool is for, you kind of want to know what it can and what it can't do. So uh, that actually is a good description of what CLI can do. A Amazon, I'm going to use Amazon Web Services a lot because they have a very robust, uh, kind of hard to use website on their own web services side if you do a lot of like the administration and stuff because there's just so much to it. But they also have a very robust command line interface to do all those same things. So if you want to spin up an EC2 server, you want to create 
create users and you want to set permissions, you can do all that without the web interface. You can just use the command line interface. And it's, theirs is really good. Um, and so it, it allows access at scale. Is it a convenient tool for complex processes? So knowing that it's just text-based, knowing that maybe you don't get as uh, deep of feedback as you would maybe in a web interface where you can do toast pop-ups and you can do colors and you can do um, and you can do colors in terms where you can do maybe like modals and things like that. Would you imagine that a CLI is good for complex processes? Yes, no, maybe? No. So it's both. Uh, there are, you can do complex processes in a CLI because the thing to keep in mind is that some complex processes don't require a lot of input. Some complex processes, you ever filled out a 75 field form? I don't want to do that with flags on the CLI and passing 75 flags, like that's painful. So there's some things yes and some things no. Now, here's an interesting one. Would a CLI be a great choice for a non-power user? So we've heard the term power user before, and it's kind of the people that like know your, your product inside and out, and they do things with it that you may not have even expected, or your company may not have even expected. Would a command line interface be a good choice for maybe the beginners? So you're shaking your head no, you're absolutely right. So you really, if you're creating a brand new product, you probably want to focus on your web interface, on your graphical interface, if it's a desktop app or something else, if it's a web app or a mobile app, focus on that graphical interface. A little bit for, more so or first than your command line interface because the beginners, even people that have used a lot of command line interfaces, they're probably going to gravitate towards seeing how it works graphically first, and then say, okay, now, now that I know how your stuff works, what are the more powerful things I can do? So, is it a great choice for power users? Well, if it's not for non-power users, then it's a, it's a fantastic choice for power users. Is it a graphical interface? No. Okay. So now that we know the what, let's look at some of the why. When and why would we want to build or use a CLI? So we have things like speed and efficiency. If I'm a power user and I already know ahead of time a lot of the fields that I need to populate or a lot of the switches, I, I can just type that. I don't have to go to your website, log in, find, navigate to the thing, oh crap, you've moved now, you changed navigation. Find out where the new th th thing lives now, the new navigation, go to the thing, input the fields, finally I can hit submit and I'm done, right? I mean, when you're a power user of a thing, that takes a lot of time. And we're, and we're only talking minutes, but still, you do that with, if you're a system admin or a user admin, you're updating credentials for 15 people, 15 people times five minutes each, it's a lot of time. Portability, so, and I have an asterisk beside it, so I'll go over that in a second, but portability is a, is a big deal because I want somebody on a Windows-based machine or a Mac-based machine to be able to access my stuff, right? And so the web gives us that, the web gives us portability. Uh, we, we might have to fight some browser differences, but, um, but for the most part, the web gives us that, but my power users are still at play. And if I have a command line interface, I can build it with things that are highly portable. Um, now, depending on what you use to build a CLI, it may run across OSs. So there's Bash for Windows, uh, Nix systems like uh, Linux, Mac, which is Nix based, can generally execute Bash by default. If you build it with something like Go, so if you can build command line tools with things other than Bash. I am not a big fan of Bash. It's kind of where you need to start though, to kind of learn the why some things work the way they work. Um, and also it, it is, as you get into it, there are a lot of very quick and short things you can do with Bash that require very few keystrokes. So it, there are some powerful things you can do with. But Go, you can build the binary per the, per the target, so you say, you can have the Go runtime build an executable for Windows, build a VMG, uh, I think it's called, for Mac, build a um, APK or whatever it's called, no, not APK, what's the thing for Linux? I forget, but I don't do a lot of Linux. So, uh, <laughs> but you, you basically have the runtime build the binaries. Now for something else like Node.js, so if you're familiar with Node, those of you going to the code camps, I know y'all are, because they're teaching that heavy. Um, okay, so every, almost everybody in here is familiar with Node. If you write a command line interface that is to be interpreted, remember JavaScript is an interpreted language, not a, not a compiled and executed language. To be interpreted with Node, it'll run on any system that has Node installed. So there's your 
portability for, you know, um, and with Node, you have the packages like um, Path or things like that, that that will take care of the differences between the operating systems. So if I, wanna, if I have a command line that creates some files, um, if I enter, if I use those, that layer that the tool provides, that Node provides, then it, it's portable. It'll, it'll run on any, any OS that has Node in it. Okay, so now that we know some reasons why, oh, customized utilities. You can build command line tools for things that like, oh, I just have a thing I keep doing and I just want to build something to do it quicker, and I built a little command line utility. I, I've done this a bunch. They're never published. They're, they're, the code's ugly, but it helps me, and that's all that really matters. So those are good use cases. So when and why not? Okay, command line utilities. You, you would think there's no graphical interface. They're cheap to build. I'll build a product, and I'll, or I'll build a, a system or a, a thing, and I'll just build a command line interface. Sorry, that's probably not what you should do. Remember that whole thing about power users versus non-power users? And power users of thing X, just because they're power users of thing X, they're not power users of your thing. They have to learn your thing somehow, which is typically gonna be a graphical interface, to become power users. Then they can do a CLI. They're not beginner friendly. Uh, 75 step forms. If you've got a thing that takes 75, 80 input, if you've got tax documents, I don't wanna fill out tax documents on a command line, okay? <laughs> So there's some good reasons why not to. And let's look at the core tenants next. So, and, I, and the first one here is very important, and um, I have a list of resources at the end. And that first one, it's basically a, a rewording of SRP, if, if you're familiar with the single responsibility principle. Basically means have a function, it does one thing, one thing only. Have your command line kind of be like that, have a core mission. There is a talk given by the developers of the Heroku command line interface, which is a very well done command line interface. And that is how they word it. And so um, I've linked to them on the assets. They word it like that and I like it. Have a core mission. Okay, so your CLI, if you have a CLI called user manager, okay. Probably doesn't need to be managing shopping carts and products and uh, things like that. Probably just needs to be managing users. Tend to stick with some norms, um, standard user inputs, or standard, yeah, input structures. So you have the, the program name. So every command line always has the program name. If I'm running AWS's command line, it starts with AWS. That's how the operating system knows what thing you're executing. After that, you have commands and ops, right? So commands, you also can have areas. So like with AWS, you have AWS EC2. That lets the AWS runtime know, okay, or lets their command line interface know, okay, I'm doing something with EC2. So if I say create, they know it's create in the context of the EC2 arena. Um, but for the most part, for, for let's talk about smaller command line interfaces. You're gonna have a command such as create user, and you'll have options. Here's the user's name. So if you've ever done any command line work with a database like Postgres, you just say create user, pass in a couple options, done. Feedback and output, okay? One of, the, one of the things that I hate whenever I use a command line tool that just spits out text that has no, no um, prefixes to the lines or nothing, if I run into an issue and I have to wade through all that, it's hard to know what, what to look for. Use things like, even if it's as simple as just square bracket, log, square bracket. You're just logging info. Square bracket, error, square bracket. So if I have something that doesn't go the way I want it to, I can look at your output and I can typically say, okay, it didn't go the way I wanted it to, maybe there's an error. Okay, it, no errors. Didn't go the way I wanted it to, maybe there's some, if I pass in the verbose flag, a lot of CLIs allow passing in a flag called verbose, which means I'm gonna just log all the things and, and spit that out in the standard output. Maybe I can go through that and maybe see some debug information or maybe see you know something, but allow people the opportunity to kind of like systematically look through with the stuff that you're printing out. Explicit communication on results. Okay, if you execute a command, on a terminal command, and then all of a sudden it just spits you back to, or to the input phase, and it doesn't tell you, yes, we did the thing you asked, or no, we couldn't do the thing you asked, that is very frustrating. Now I have to either go look for the file that should have been created, or I have to log into the website and look for the user, or I have to run another command to get users to see if that user was created. Don't do that, all right? <laughs> Always make 
making sure that the results are explicit because again, no graphic interface. You can't just pop up a thumbs up. Now there's some packages you can do toast no you can do um, toast style notifications. Uh, and we, we're not going to look at that in this talk, but it's a thing you can do. And there's helpers out there like if you're doing a node based um, command line interface. There's helpers to do that. But if we're just kind of sticking with command line for the most part, you're you're not going to have a whole lot of mechanisms at your disposal. It's really just text. So just very clearly state yes, we did we created a user. Here's his ID, or her ID, whatever the case may be. Oh, there it is. Cool. All right. Parsing the argv. All right. <laughs> argv stands for argument vector. Okay. It is a one-dimensional string array, and I am not a uh, historian by any stretch on a lot of these things. Um, I just tend to retain random tidbits as I read things. So. If I get any of this off by a bit, then please uh, accept my apology up front. But my understanding is this, that you ever seen how that like some programs, the main function like C++ has int main and it has an array of just args? Okay. There wasn't really a whole notion of like named, ar named parameters and all these kind of things that we have in, in abstracted languages. Like C Sharp, you have named parameters, parameters for default, for JavaScript, you have an, you just pass in an object and whatever. Uh, anything goes. And uh, with Go, you have typed parameters and all these things. So, what they had at that time was just argument vector. It's just an array, a uh, one dimensional array of arguments. And in this case, it is strings. It's all strings. All strings all the time. So, if you pass it in a thing called, uh, so we're going with user man. That's our, that's our command line utility. User man manages users. It lets us create a user, pass in some ops. Username equals Billy, password equals secret, and sometimes with the ops, you'll see a shortcut not notation. A and then 25, so maybe that's age or something, right? This 25 in the argument vector is gonna be a string. It's always string in the, in the terminal, okay? And, and bash is what we're gonna look at first, so it's always strings. All right, so if we, if we think about the argument vector here, User main is zero, the, the command is always zero. Create user is one, okay? So if we're thinking about an array index. You, dash dash username equals Billy, that's one argument. So that's position two in the array. Password equals secret, position three. Now here we get to a space. So it's basically limited. So even though 25 goes with A, it's an argument of position four is dash A, Position five is 25. So this is what that array looks like, right? So that's kind of, it's a little bit frustrating uh, in parsing that, and I'll, and I'll show you some examples. So let's look at the, now we have a little bit of light of coding, which is always uh, fun and uh, <laughs> a little nerve wracking for a, for a speaker, but, uh, but let's do it. here is a file called our first CLI, firstCLI.sh. So we're dealing with bash, okay? Which is kind of where you, you want to start with building, or I found it useful to kind of start there. We have a directive at the top that basically just tells our operating system what it's going to execute this file, okay? You can also uh, make a file, if you create a file like on Linux or Mac, you can you have to run chmod to make it executable, um, but the directive part is very important. That's that's super important. But as far as the contents of the file, the directive is, is extremely important. The directive can actually allow you to do some other things. So what if I don't want to use Bash? What if I want to use Node? What if I want to use Python? Python is very popular for command line uh, tools. What if I want to use Go? You can build command line tools with Go. Um, so that actually is going to be the key piece that allows us to do that, and we'll walk it, we'll walk through it in a second. So let's look at specifically the argument vector. All right. So what I've got here is just a little uh, a little sample that basically uses some 
funny symbols, so a dollar sign hash sign. In bash, what you're doing there is you're getting the, it's the count of all arguments. So dollar sign is kind of a way to interact with arguments. So you can say dollar sign zero, dollar sign one, dollar sign 10, if you know all the positions of your argument. Uh, and some command lines are built that way. Some command lines, if you pass in arguments in the wrong positions, it'll do weird things, which I find frustrating. But it's kind of how it works if you're using bash. So we can say that there were a certain number of arguments passed in by those symbols. We can iterate. So we can go for, do, done, do. Iterate through it. We have a, a variable called i that's just a counter. And we're doing this thing called echo, which is basically just printing. So remember when I said you, if you're going to be printing things and you have a command line interface? Echo is how you print in, in Bash. All right, now here's some more fun stuff. All right, if our arguments are greater than zero, the argument length. So with Bash, again, I'm not a historian, but my understanding is that they did some kind of uh, mechanisms to conserve space because they didn't have a lot of, they didn't have 15 terabytes of RAM like the <laughs> Right? Which we don't even have it today, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. We, they didn't have wow. 16 gigabytes quad core right. supercomputer back then in the palm of your hand. So, so they had these, um, these mechanisms. So you'd have a couple square brackets. You would just have these flags like dash GT. Dash Z is one that, that we may look at a little later. Um, it's how you check to see if something's empty or not. Why Z? I, I couldn't tell you again, I'm not a deep historian. Um, not really any historian. I just know that some of these things I've just read, it was like, oh, they conserve space. Rather than writing end if, they wrote phi. They did phi. So which is if backwards. Okay. Uh, and that basically said, tells the interpreter, okay, you're done with your if statement. So here we see Ryan executing arguments positionally. 